Between the Lines, How Ernie Barnes Went from the Football Field to the Art Gallery by Sandra Neal Wallace, illustrated by Caldecott Honor Recipient Brian Collier. Between the Lines Ernest loved the North Carolina rain. He waited for the backyard to turn into mud, painting mud. Then Ernest found a stick and painted in the slippery soil. He drew straight lines and curved lines, looped lines and crossed lines, lines that kept moving past his father's new picket fence and in to Willard Street. The neighbors wondered what Ernest was painting. They followed the lines to see where they led. Mama saw how Ernest loved to paint. But in the segregated South, she did not feel welcome in the art museum. So on sunny days, she brought Ernest with her to work. Mama was a housekeeper for a lawyer in Durham's white section. Ernest hadn't known anyone with a library until Mr. Fuller. The room smelled of leather books and mahogany frames that Mama polished. Ernest stared at the beautiful paintings in the frames. They told stories without words. Ernest had trouble with words. Quiet and shy, he rarely spoke. He didn't know what to say when kids from the neighborhood picked on him. And he wouldn't fight back. Instead, he hurried home and painted. When Ernest grew too old to mud paint, he carried a sketchbook. The neighbors wondered what Ernest was drawing. He drew the junk man peddling hubcaps, families walking home from church, the old man snoring on the green sofa in the vacant lot while the kids played football. In the summer of 1951, most kids in Ernest's neighborhood dreamed of being professional athletes. Hey man, they'd say, what did Mays do today? Ernest didn't want to play baseball or football. His hands were drawing hands. Ernest grew to be six foot three. The football coach at Hillside High wanted him on the team. Ernest told his coach his mama wouldn't let him play. One afternoon, when Ernest came home from school, he found the coach in the kitchen eating Mama's cooking. On the table was a donation for Mama's church. Ernest knew his drawing hands would soon be playing for the Hornets. Coach made him an offensive lineman. Ernest played center and became captain of the team. Ernest was so good at blocking that college scouts watched him play. He was offered 26 scholarships. Ernest chose North Carolina College at Durham, an all-black university across the street from Hillside High. He studied art and played football. In his first year of college, the civil rights movement pushed for greater freedom for African Americans. Now Ernest and his art class could visit the museum. Ernest searched for paintings of people like him. He didn't see any. He had to find the words to ask the tour guide an important question. Ernest moved closer, gathering the words in his head. Where are the paintings by Negro artists? He asked. Surprised by Ernest's question, the tour guide paused. Your people don't express themselves in that way, he said. Ernest knew they did. His teacher had shown slides of artwork by Henry O'Tanner, Edmonia Lewis, and Palmer Hayden. But what would Ernest paint? His canvas stayed blank. His art teacher, Mr. Wilson, drove Ernest through the neighborhood. Inside the homes, Ernest knew the rhythm of laughter from his father's ragtime piano and the hard times. Ernest and Mr. Wilson yanked up a shoe stuck in the muddy walkway, a shoe with a story to be painted about hard times. Art is all around you, Mr. Wilson told Ernest. Use what you see. You catch my drift? Thinking about what Mr. Wilson had said, Ernest looked around his neighborhood. It no longer appeared ordinary. In the movement of every football play, in the explosion of a kickoff, in the swivel and swerves of game action, he saw beauty. He had found what to paint. Who is going to feed you if you become a painter? asked Ernest's father. Ernest wasn't sure. 
In his senior year of college, National Football League scouts came to watch Ernest play. We are going to draft you, they told him. But he didn't think they were serious. He had other plans. On draft day in 1959, Ernest waited in Mama's kitchen the whole day. No telegram came. In the morning, Ernest spotted his name in the newspaper. He ran outside to tell Mama. I'm going to be in the pros, he shouted. Ernest would earn a living playing football for the Baltimore Colts. A few weeks later, Ernest rode a bus to watch the Colts play in the NFL championship game. He heard the thwack of a tangled lineman butting shoulders on the field. He saw the sweaty faces of his new team, who sat shoulder to shoulder on the bench. Players lunged forward, itching to play. Back home, the sideline images still swirled in Ernie's mind. Jersey numbers, bruising cobalt blue, referee calls, roaring crimson red, sharp shoulders draped in goalpost white. Everything was so clear that Ernest didn't draw it in his sketchbook. He sketched out a canvas, reaching for a palette knife, and painted, quickly. Before the image had disappeared from his mind, he'd created his first football painting. He called it The Bench. Ernest decided that he'd never part with it. That summer, Ernest carried the painting to the Colts training camp. A reporter caught sight of it and wrote about it in the newspaper. He called Ernest Ernie, and the name stuck. Ernie kept the bench under his bed for safekeeping. On the last day of training camp, he was cut from the team. You have everything but experience, the coach told Ernie. The new American Football League picked up Ernie's contract. Crash! Bang! Boom! Ernie's drawing hands hauled down his opponents every Sunday. His spike-bottom cleats drew lines in the muddy field. But Ernie's sketchbook remained empty. In a magazine, Ernie read, I am a Negro by Paul R. Williams. Negroes wake up, Williams wrote. Real emancipation lies in your own intellectual effort. Ernie did not want to take his freedom for granted. He thought about his wish to be an artist. Ernie longed to paint, but his fingers were too swollen from blocking. When Ernie broke his hand in a game, a cast was put on so that he could still play. Even so, the coach dropped Ernie from the team. A want ad in the newspaper caught Ernie's attention. Good salary guaranteed, it read. But there was no guarantee as a door-to-door -door salesman. Still, he took the job. He challenged himself to learn eight new words a day. With every doorbell he rang and each door knocker he knocked, Ernie added more words to the list. He sold brushes and cosmetics. Then he told his customers why he wanted to be an artist. And they listened. Playing football earned more money than selling brushes. So after his hand healed, Ernie joined another team. He tucked a stubby pencil and a small notepad into his football socks. During timeouts, he scribbled notes about what he saw on the line of scrimmage, nicknamed the pit. He saw players clawing, scraping, reaching, fighting to win. With his swollen hands, Ernie drew lines, making them stretch even farther. Each time the coach caught Ernie sketching, he fined him $50. Ernie kept drawing. One time, when he reached for his notepad, it was gone. He watched the pieces of paper floating above the field in the wind. Hey, Barnes, the coach yelled. You could be great if only you would get that art out of your head. In the last game of the 1964 season, it rained. The field turned into mud, painting mud. Ernie studied the uniforms covered in muddy brown. Linemen surging, blocking steely blue, clashing bodies, stinging bloody scarlet. He followed the rain up to the brooding sky, listening to the roar in the stadium. He imagined the players as gladiators in a coliseum, wearing coats of armor, fighting for their lives. Ernie had to paint the story. After the game, he told his coach he was finished playing football. With no money for rent, Ernie painted on the stoop outside a Los Angeles motel room. He pawned watches and art books for food. He worried. Would anyone buy his paintings? Ernie needed a game plan to sell his artwork. Leafing through a magazine, 
Ernie read a letter written by the famous painter Vincent van Gogh. I have a lot of work to do, but I still have the firm hope to succeed, van Gogh had written. Encouraged by van Gogh's words, Ernie came up with a brilliant game plan. He gathered his paintings and carried them to a meeting for the owners of the American Football League. Ernie tapped on the microphone to get their attention. I want to become the official artist for the American Football League, he began. Someone asked Ernie a question. When can you come to New York and bring your paintings with you? It was Sonny Warblin, owner of the New York Jets. Sonny offered Ernie a football player's salary, but he didn't want Ernie to play. He wanted him to paint. Then Ernie would have his own show in a New York gallery. Day after day, Ernie painted. One night, Mama called. Ernie's father was very sick. Ernie drove his U-Haul full of paintings to Willard Street. He wanted to go home to see his father one last time. In the backyard, the fence his father had built sagged, a withered gray. Ernie leaned his paintings against it. It was perfect, Ernie decided. Ernie framed his paintings with pieces of his father's fence and drove back to New York City. On the opening night of Ernie's show, the gallery buzzed with activity. Visitors marveled at what Ernie had painted. A woman stuck red sold stickers next to his drawings and paintings. The bench, Ernie's first football painting, was not for sale. Ernie kept that as his own. For years afterward, Ernie's drawing hands painted stories. Celebrities, art lovers, and athletes pushed close to admire his paintings in galleries and museums across the country. One day, school children came to visit the museum in North Carolina. They asked to see the paintings by African American artists. The tour guide showed them the newest exhibit. The artist was Ernie Barnes. They saw paintings of flowers growing in cracked sidewalks. They saw football players sparring like gladiators, their hopeful hands reaching for the ball. They saw dancers painted in bright dresses and blue jeans swaying to the rhythm of saxophones glinting gold. In Ernie's paintings, they saw hope. They saw struggle. They saw beauty. Historical note. When I became an athlete, I didn't stop being an artist. Ernie Barnes. Ernie Barnes was born on Rembrandt's birthday, July 15, in 1938. Named after his father, a tobacco clerk, Ernie grew up in the segregated south of Durham, North Carolina. That meant he didn't have equal access to museums, art galleries, or public libraries, and attended all black schools. But his mother, Fannie Mae, made certain her children knew about music and art. She ran the household of Flank Fuller, a wealthy white lawyer, and brought home discarded classical records and art books. Ernie visited the Fullers often, where he discovered the art of 16th century painters, including Michelangelo. By the time he entered school, Ernie knew he wanted to be an artist. Shy and sensitive, Ernie sought hiding places in school so he could sketch and avoid being bullied. A high school weightlifting coach discovered him in the halls and helped him become a star athlete. Ernie became an offensive lineman and played pro football with three teams in the American Football League. The American Football League merged with the National Football League in 1970. But ignoring his artistic dream proved frustrating. Viewing football as a contest of beauty and grace, Ernie sketched in the sidelines, exaggerating the players' movements and shapes. Ernie's game experience gave his work another dimension. Art critics praised him as America's best painter of sports since George Bellows. In 1984, Ernie became the official artist of the Olympic Games. By then, Ernie was a household name. Elevating daily life with dignified paintings of playground scenes and dance halls, his exhibit, The Beauty of the Ghetto, became the face of the Black, of the Black is Beautiful cultural movement. The exhibit toured the United States from 1972 to 1979, hosted by politicians and presidents, including Jimmy Carter. The focal painting, Sugar Shack, was shown each week as part of the closing credits on the TV sitcom Good Times. The lead character of the show, J.J. Evans, and his aspirations of being a painter were modeled after Ernie Barnes's life. 
Sugar Shack, depicting dancers enjoying the rhythm at a jazz club, has been called one of the five greatest paintings in American history. When rhythm and blues artist Marvin Gaye saw the painting, he put it on his next album cover. Ernie Barnes has been called the creator of the neo-mannerism art movement. But to many, Barnes brought movement to art and elevated the ordinary to the extraordinary. Ernie Barnes died in Los Angeles on April 27, 2009, from a rare blood disorder at the age of 70. He never sold his first football painting, The Bench. It has a permanent place of honor in the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Today, Ernie's work hangs in museums in Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York City, Washington, D.C., and Daphne, Alabama. There's an author's note and an illustrator's note. I invite you to pause here and read what they both have to say, but for now, it's the end. The end.